Hi, Rick. Um, thanks for agreeing to do this call. Uh, this is our sure, second man. second conversation. Right. So I've, I've got a few questions for you. <laughs> yeah, of course. If you don't mind. A couple of technical... Any good interviewer should, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so a couple of technical <laughs> yeah. ones. So I've watched you do a couple of videos about hydrogen peroxide and UV light. Right. Um, I think you did a, a, a white area of a comic and you did a coloured area. And the hydrogen right. peroxide seemed to do a pretty good job of um, getting rid of the browning on the, on the white areas. Nice. What, what, that was a 35% hydrogen peroxide solution you were using? It was. I do, I do make a special mix. So it, that's, you can use that. I use 35% peroxide. I, my total solution is probably around 25 to 35% peroxide, but I put phosphoric acid in it. Um, as it's more of a preservative and, a, and it helps it to penetrate paper. And then I put just about 10th of a gram per liter of Triton X100 surfactant in it too, to help it also to penetrate more. Okay. Okay. Cause I've got some hydrogen peroxide on order. I'm going to give it, a, give it a go. Um, because this is a, yeah, it looked quite effective. So, I presume it's the release of the oxygen as a free radical that's that's causing that whitening effect. Yeah, I actually doing a book right now. It's this uh, Wonder Woman, and you can maybe tell a little bit how it was brown here. Yes, yeah, I can see just see the remains. Yeah, and it's I'll show some someday. I'll do an original picture too. And there's uh, this whole edge. This whole book was very dirty, and I find and other people have shared with me too that mixing it with um, uh, the immaculate clean actually works for a while. I mean, that's that solution when you mix peroxide with yep. immaculate cleans only going to last a couple hours, but because right. uh, they'll destroy each other. But mixing the two makes a surprisingly good cleaning and whitening solution that I had thought to do, but two people independently shared that with me. It works great. So I thought, oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm going to try that. Here's um, something to. So, so this book here was really dirty. Yeah, I got it. And it was like, I'll show some before pictures later, but I was like, okay, well, I'll get it. it had that classic kind of brown sort of shadow. Okay, yeah. I'll wipe that. I'm always loath to use the peroxide because I worry about the long term effects of it on paper, especially in fiddlement. That's what was going to be my, that was going to be my question. You know, it might clean up and go white initially, but does it suddenly go horribly brown again in a year's time? I'll show you this. Uh, this document was given to me by a friend. He, his family came, I think he said from El Salvador. They only had two documents with him, of which this was one. And this was his like mother or grandmother's, uh, you know, graduation certificate. It had been like folded so much yeah. that it couldn't get it straight the other day. And I repaired it. This sort of, this sort of stiffening, see how it's stiff right here yeah. Yeah. of the paper. And this kind of is, is a, is a result of oxidation. You know? And so Oxidation, I'm worried that this sort of browning and stiffening is what's going to happen to the paper in, in books. And I don't know, I don't have a lot of evidence for this, but some people have been sending me some really interesting papers, but I had found some papers independently, but other people, I, I'm uh, happily a, a magnet and a source for people who find the academic research paper and they send them to me and say, hey, what about this? Hey, what about this? And there's a certain frequencies of light that tend to make more brown because I tell you two stories. One story is, hey, uh, oxidation makes paper brown. I'll tell you another story. Hey, oxidation by peroxide, free radical makes it white, yeah, right? Yeah. So what story are you supposed to believe? Uh, well, it ends up the frequency of the light, the light, wave, the light makes a big difference. And um, some, some frequencies do make it hit brown and it ends up, it's the visible, uh, visibly blue light that tends to, um, and I think it's the three, I have, I have it in my email. I have to find it. It's a, I had written it down too, but it's, it's this, the longer wavelengths, not the shorter wavelengths that actually that are in sort of the blue field close to the near blue yeah. UV that actually make it, make it turn, um, make it turn white again. Now what it's doing, what's happening, I'll tell you a little bit more about this book in a moment, but what's happening is that oxidation makes conjugation. So there's like, imagine these two bonds like this, and this is yeah. carbon, carbon between my thumbs yeah. and these are, these are hydrogens coming up. Yep. What happens is they will, the, the hydrogens will leave because they'll pick up an oxygen each and then they'll make H2 gas and leave or they'll uh, electron each and they'll do that or they'll pick up an oxygen leave as water. 
those are the two mechanisms. Yeah. And then they have this Markovnikov addition is the other way, but they, so they collapse and make a double bond like this. This double bond, if there's a double bond here and then a single bond and then a double bond here, that's called conjugation. This conjugation is yellow. Right. So that isn't often in paper. It's often in oils and other stuff that touch the paper to have this conjugation. We call it sebum or oils in your hands. Yeah. That sebum gets conjugated. It turns what we call universal yellow, which is the conjugation in all gunk that has this yellow appearance to it. So one way to, um, to make that not so yellow is oxidation is to, you still have these double bonds, but yeah. you break the single bond between them. So now they're not conjugated. They're discrete double yeah. bonds. Yeah. So they're sitting over here, sitting over there. So they're no longer creating this what we call particle in a box okay. uh, model. So they're not absorbing light the same way. So you break them in more. So if you had the power to add just enough peroxide and had the peroxide prefer to only go to that sebum, you'd be in business, right? You would have made it, it's the stuff still there. Yeah. You can't see it. It's not yellow. Yeah. But the problem is whenever you add an excess, it hits the paper. Now the paper polymerizes, right? That's the source of strength of the paper. But the sort of if I'm where I'm representing it, the vertical cross link yeah, yeah. of the yeah. paper. And and the and the lignin is especially you know sensitive to it. You break those and all of a sudden you lose what we call the ductility, like the flexibility of the of the paper. That's where the strength comes. You know, you can yeah. imagine if you stacked a bunch of two by fours on each other, they would fall down easily, but not so easily if they had a board this way, right? So you, yeah. Yeah. you lose that strength and they fall apart. And so I don't know what the metric for two by fours is. Sorry. <laughs> and we have we have we use the same thing in the UK as well. Okay, got Although it. Sorry. We've metric. A lot of it's still we're still using a lot of the old. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. Well, and that's the source of it. You you would do this, and it, but the problem with that is that it doesn't always. I don't know why it should be immediate, right? But it doesn't always happen right, right away. Like paper tends to. I think it, I think what you do is you bring it closer to some point where it's going to be visibly more brittle, and then just the natural aging on top of that is like you've accelerated it to a point where it's going to get brittle faster. And so what happens here is that if I look, I have this little microscope. And I'm watching what's going on because I've only been oxidizing with peroxide this band here and this other band. Correct. And I can already see, even without it, actually, I can feel with my finger that the, the paper is uh, rougher. It's not as smooth as, as it was in only a couple of treatments. Now, is it wider? You don't, you can't tell from this video, but it is significantly wider than it yeah. was. It was yeah. A brown streak down here. Yeah, yeah. If I if it's in a coffin, I call it coffins or a slab. If it's in a plastic slab, can you tell? You're probably not going to tell. But if you look at it closely, you might get something that they now call pebbling. If you get a grater, we'll come back to you and say, "Hey, there's pebbling, significant pebbling on the surface." And if you look at it in the light, you do this and you wink one eye, you can see that it's you know little tiny spots in there when you overdo it. And I think graders are going to start picking up. If they ha I think they have already. I think they're going to start picking up on that sort of oxidation treatment that they call uh, pebbling. So you have to be careful. Now, can you do just UV light and not the peroxide and, and avoid that situation? I think you can. The UV light is minimally effective on its own. Eventually, you're going to expose the inks to so much UV light that they'll start to fade. Yeah. I mean, you're, we're lucky that We're lucky that the the sebum is more sensitive to it, absorbs it more quickly and turns white faster. But the amount of time and hours you need to really do it without any chemical help is, um, is, is a long time. It's going to be in the order of days that you need to, to white anything. And by that time, you're going to start losing color, especially uh, in the, the, the opposite end, you know, the things yeah. that, ref that absorb blue, which is the reds, right? The things that are the opposite yeah. Yeah. are yeah. going to start to fade. And, and, and so that's the thing I fear. That's I, I really, I'm reluctant to use it. I use it as experiments and where it's absolutely yeah. needed. You know, I do some even more dangerous things <laughs> to books where it's absolutely needed and I really need to. That's like they would frighten you probably. But yeah. Uh, but I try to, so I tend to steer away from it. But it is useful. And if you're only going to slab books and you only want to make money and you just want to get rid of the book right away, it is, it's a favorite. It really, it has been for a long time. 
Right. So, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just doing some experimentation on, you know, comp stuff that's worth nothing. Um, and I did my first, so I've, I've done dry cleaning for quite a long while, and I've been using your Immaculate Clean for a few months. I've probably done 300 books with Immaculate Clean, which Ooh. works really, really well on older, older comic books. Uh, in fact, it works really well on, I collect the UK Alan Class comics from the sort of 1960s, and it works really well on them. Um, but I'm... I have used it once on a on a newer comic, and I got some colour coming off it quite badly. So I I don't use the Immaculate Clean on newer comics. Yeah, I think I'm going to start trying to find out how that how where that works and and sort of advise against using it. But it's hard to tell when because I myself haven't seen it, but I've had many reports of yeah, modern books of it coming off. Yeah, and I've I've heard that it even happens differently on two different books that are modern, like it might come off of one and not the other. And I don't know, there's a, the ink has changed a lot lately. And I don't know the solubility. I suspect it's more, less the Immaculate Clean and more the water in the Immaculate Clean that's doing it. Cause I think yeah, it could be. as there's, as there's been a push to make inks more sort of ecologically friendly. Yeah. I think yeah. that they're more water soluble. I think yeah. they're not going to last as long as the older inks. Um, you know, with the sizing agents, with removing the the rosin and yeah. the sulfur, so that we don't have sulfuric acid from the sizing agents, we've had to sort of get different. We've had to use different inks, and the inks are now water based or water soluble inks. Well, they used to be solvent based inks, and they would put the solvent based inks on the rosin. The solvent would evaporate. You've got a nice strongly binding. So now they're water based inks. They're put on a very weak sizing agent. It's little surprise that water takes that back off. <laughs> I, I, th I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's I think it's uh, exactly that. I think it's more water soluble inks, and it's probably the water in the solution that's pulling this stuff off. Whereas the older yeah. comics, it, it 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 takes off the surface dirt, and it does give a bit of a gloss to the yellows and reds as well, particularly. And whether it's taking a very thin layer off the top of those just to clean them up, I don't know. But you can't see any color, color rub on it when you've used it. But it definitely does make them pop. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I find that just by measuring the thickness of the the ink, you know, which you can do if you can penetrate it uh, a little bit uh, with IR, especially you can like tell how thick it is. Yeah. And intensity. Um, there's a tiny bit of ink coming off. And what happens is I think it's the ink that's been oxidized, right? It's the ink that's had a little bit of spritz uh, in it okay. that's removing the, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah, ink okay. below that. Oh, that makes it's sense. That new, makes sense. Yeah. Brand new ink. And so it looks, it hasn't been exposed to the world. It looks great. And it happens more in the reds and yellows, right? They're more soluble. So they really start, like, some of my books in particular look really good when I do that. I um, uh, we think I have, what was it? Was it this book? No, I have a, um, yeah, this one here. I haven't pressed it yet, but this old Spider-Man. See how red his yeah, is here? yeah, yeah. And that it's like ridiculously red, right? Yeah, and so yeah. I was like, "Wow, okay." So I cleaned it. I need to press it still, but I was like, "Geez, that book is like so red now." That his his suit. So, uh, and the rest of the colors are kind of muted. You know, they really aren't. <laughs> yeah, like, so the red really like stands that. out, doesn't it? Yeah, it works really like, well. Wow, okay. I, I bought it. I bought an issue of. Um, the witching hour number one and the the, the witching hours in red on white at the top of it and i gave it a clean with the immaculate clean and it just went boom like that and it looks fantastic now yeah very impressive. yeah that's, that's good stuff you know it took me like almost seven years to land on that solution of immaculate clean that i liked it was the i think the 19th solution it was that i i really okay. i called it i I used to call it RCC one RCC it was Rick's Comet cleaner one, two, three, four, whatever. And it was 19, my 19th formulation that I landed on. And it takes a long time to make the stuff. Yeah. I have to have a cracking column, you know, and all these things. Cause the soap, it doesn't really exist outside of my garage, you know, which I mean, <laughs> so it took me a while to get there. And I have, I went through a lot of comic books, you know, just like you're doing to land on that particular, uh, formulation so i'm glad i'm glad to have the feedback that's working it's doing exactly as it was designed to do 
yeah, clean no, and make the colors pop in Silver Age, Copper Age books, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's what it does 